well, hey, how are you this fine day? Well, things are looking beautiful here in Florida. Um, it is the 1st of January, and I hope you had a wonderful 2022. Here we are in 2023, and it's looking good so far. What's gonna happen over the next six weeks is that we put together the top programs that you, you, the viewer, have chosen as being the top programs of the Chapel Hour. And let me tell you, it's gonna be great. These were some fantastic programs and everybody loved them and they got a lot of activity and we just believe that they're worthy of seeing a second time. So these are previously recorded programs that you're about to see for the next six weeks, but they're not just any previously recorded programs, they're the best of 2022 of the Chapel Hour. Um, right after these six, I want to I want to just give you a little bit of a teaser because right after this, we're going to see uh, an update from Jim and Becky Leach from Romania. That's fantastic. You are you will not want to miss that. Uh, then right after that, we've got a two-hour program where Ruth, Rebecca, Rachel, and I stood around the piano and just sang every song that we knew and all the memories that we had. And a lot of you are a part of that program because we talked about you. Ooh, yep, you're gonna to wanna to not miss that program. And then at the very end, right before we start up with the Weissart Family Singers in the Chapel Hour again for 2023, we're gonna show the bloopers of the Weissart Family Singers in the Chapel Hour. You won't wanna miss that either. It's gonna be, it's gonna be, you're gonna get a good laugh out of that, I promise. But for now, just sit back and enjoy for the next six weeks the best of the best, the cream of the crop of the Chapel Hour and the Weisheart Family Singers. I think you're going to enjoy this. Today, I can officially announce that I have reached the ripe old age of 90 years old. And the wonderful thing about that is that the Lord has allowed me to continue ministering His Word.
And for 
Welcome once again to the Weishart Family Singers Chapel Hour. I trust all is going well with you wherever you are. According, according to my calendar, today is Grandparents' Day. So a happy Grandparents' Day to all you grandparents, great-grandparents, great-grandparents, or if you go further than that, uh, to you also. <laughs> This is the sixth message in our series on Nothing is Too Hard for God. And today our subject has to do with uh, finances. What if you lost all your children, some friends, property, finances, all within just maybe an hour or so? And then a few days later, you lose your health. One man in the Old Testament did just that. And instead of going from the pit to the palace like Joseph did, he went from the palace to the pit. Job literally went from rags, to, from riches to rags. Let me read something to you from Billy Graham's devotional book, Day by Day. Tell me what you think about money, and I will tell you what you think about God. For these two are closely related. A man's heart is closer to his wallet than anything else. It is a staggering fact that for the past few years, people have spent ten times as much for luxuries and non-essentials as they have for all charitable and religious purposes. This is a commentary on our shallow and superficial religious faith. While the Bible warns us against greed and selfishness, it does encourage frugality and thrift. Even Jesus said to his disciples, after he had fed the multitude, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Although our Lord had the power to create, he himself lived frugally and without luxury. John Wesley had a threefold philosophy about money. He said, Make all you can, keep all you can, and give all you can. But many of us, it's like this. We get all we can, we spend all we can, we borrow all we can, and then we don't give God very much. Let me read some scriptures to you, I, I think, that will fit in with this message. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33 from the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than them? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your statute? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and then tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. And you'll notice some translation, uh, uh, the word Gentiles actually mean, can mean pagans. So it could be, After all these things do the pagans, the unbelievers seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Ephesians 3.20 now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
according to the power that worketh in us. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And then one more, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye had. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say that. God said this, so that we can say this. He has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There are people who say that Jesus talked a lot about money that he talked more about money than he did about many other things. But is this true? If you read the New Testament carefully, you will find several words that can refer to money. There's the actual word money. Then we also have the following, treasures, wealth, pounds, talents, riches, alms, gold, and silver. All of these words including money and gold and silver, can refer to either money or anything else we put our trust in, depending on the context where you find the word. The only two places where there are specific references to actual money are in Mark chapter 12, 41, the widow's might, and Matthew 17, 24 to 27, the tribute money that Peter found when Jesus sent him to find a fish to get the tribute money so that they could pay their tax. So contrary to what we may have read or heard, Jesus did, did not talk a lot about money specifically. Jesus did use money to illustrate other truths that he wished to emphasize. In both the Gospels and Acts and also the Epistles, most of the references to money have to do with how we live and what we do with what God has given to us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 and following, the word alms there can also refer to uh, deeds. It can refer to either money or deeds. And in this passage on almsgiving, Jesus is not talking about money. He is teaching us how, how not to give, how not to pray, and how not to fast. In Matthew 6, verse 19 and following, he says, lay up treasures for yourself. And here the teaching is, lay up treasures, the kind of treasures that uh, you can't take with you, but they will last on into eternity. In Matthew 6, verse 24, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon is found only four times in the New Testament, and it is found only on the lips of of Jesus. Many take the word to mean money. And I think maybe I have done the same thing in times past, but ha however, according to Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it can refer to property or earthly goods, but always with a derogatory sense of a materialistic, anti-godly, and sinful. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and 45 you find several phrases where it says, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, treasure, like a pearl. The teaching here is that heaven is worth any price that you have to pay to get it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, the parable of the servant who, who owed a large debt and then uh, his, the man he owed the money to forgave him. And then he went out, a man that owed him just a few dollars uh, he would not forgive him. So the lesson in this passage is on forgiveness. Matthew 19, verses 16 to 20, the rich young ruler, the lesson here boils down to the idea of don't love possessions more than you love people. In Luke 15, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son 
are an example of the joy there is over the conversion of one sinner. In Matthew 13, verses 1 to 23, the parable of the seeds in the sower uh, points out at one time there that uh, one type of soil, the cares of, the life, uh, cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches prevent God's word from doing its work. Jesus wasn't saying that riches were bad. He was saying, don't let earthly things crowd out heavenly things. 1 Timothy 6.10 would support that. For the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. And then Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, when Jesus cleansed the temple, Jesus, Jesus was not teaching that selling was wrong, in the Believer's Bible Commentary, the author, William MacDonald, writes the following on these two verses. This incident has a twofold message for today. In our church life, we need His cleansing power to drive out the bazaars, the suppers, and a host of other money-making gimmicks. In our personal lives, there is constant need for the purging ministry of the Lord in our bodies that are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So these are just a few of the examples that, uh, the, about the many everyday truths Jesus taught where he used money, the money term money, to illustrate spiritual truths. When you get to the book of Acts and the epistles, it isn't too much different. Most of the references to money or giving are in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Romans. Most of the references have to do with ministering to the poor and needy and to offerings that were being taken up for the poor saints in Jerusalem. When I thought about all of this and all of these examples on how they relate to how we live and what we do with what God gives us, it took me back to the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, when you look at it closely, much of Jesus' teaching was on stewardship. Two very good definitions of stewardship are, are as follows. Stewardship is the wise and proper use of money, talent, time, and resources. Or Webster's definition is the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Peter writes that we have been given everything we need, everything we need, to live a life that pleases God. That's from the contemporary version of, of the Bible. We have been given everything we need to live the kind of life God wants us to live. Christian stewardship, Christian stewardship always has to do with what we do with what God has given us, why we do it, where we do it, when we do it, and how we do it. The Sermon on the Mount has been called the very heart of Jesus' teaching. One writer states that every Christian ought to memorize the Sermon on the Mount and strive earnestly to live according to its teachings. In his book, Studies in the Sermon on the Mount, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones went so far as to say that the Sermon on the Mount is a description as to how Christians are meant to live. It, the Sermon on the Mount is not just a list of nice uh, suggestions of, of how to live. The Sermon on the Mount is telling us how we ought to be living. Jesus said, blessed or happy are the discouraged, the sorrowful, the lowly, the spiritually depressed, the merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted. These are the kinds of people we meet every day. Jesus said, it is to these kinds of people that, that we are to be salt and we are to be light. Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Jesus taught about prayer and fasting and giving and treasures in heaven. He taught about the golden rule, the straight and narrow way, building on a solid foundation. Jesus taught about worship doing radical surgery on anything in our lives that does not belong there. You remember the, where he said, if your hand 
or your feet or your eye offends you, get rid of them. Uh, it, Jesus taught about good trees bringing forth good fruit. All of these things, the Bible says, because we are children of our Father. Matthew 5, verse 45. So, as I said, when I look over all these things, I cannot really find a good, solid teaching of Jesus on finances as such. However, there are numerous scriptures that emphasize that God will always supply our need. Here are just a few of these references. In one part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that we are not to worry about the things you have to pay for or the, the things you have to use money for. Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, especially verses 32 and 30, 33, where it says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Where, or what are we going to be clothed with? For after all these things do the Gentiles or the pagans seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added to you. Luke chapter 1, verse 53, when Mary uh, went to visit Elizabeth, the Bible says just the minute Mary uh, gave a greeting to Elizabeth, the babe leaped in her womb, and she began to give forth prophetic utterances. And in one of those utterances, it said, he, she said, He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. In Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And you may remember from a past message where I pointed out to you that that those two words exceeding and abundantly in the King James Version, you'll not find a comma between them. They're, they're to be taken together just like one long word, exceeding abundantly. Because in the Greek language, those two words are the translation of just one Greek word that has about 14 or 15 letters. So uh, if what it means is, God, think of the highest level you can think of, and God can go higher than that and supply your needs. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3.20 that I just read uh, to you. Philippians 4.6 Don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then again, Hebrews 13.5 Be content with such things as you have for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man will do unto me. And then, finally, Psalm 37, 25, David said, I have been young, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his feet, seed begging bread. These scriptures emphasize that God is aware of the things that we need. And if we will live our lives faithfully for him, he will supply any needs that we may have. From all the Bible references we have covered, I think I can make some, uh, at least a couple of general observations that relate to our finances. If you have finances, use them wisely. Be ready to help those that are less fortunate. Give cheerfully and not grudgingly or, or like you feel like you just have to give. Paul said, God loveth a cheerful giver. And then God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. And then don't, don't expect a return. Luke chapter 6, verse 35 says, And uh, lend, not expecting anything in return. Matthew, in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40, we read about people responding to human need, and they never realized that 
in ministering to the, all the human need that is mentioned, they were actually ministering to Christ. Jesus said, as much as you've done it under the leash of these, you've done it unto me. So they were using their finances to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to take in the stranger, to clothe the naked, to visit those who were sick and in prison. Their actions secured for them a place in God's kingdom. Ch chapter uh, 25 and verse 34. But what if you don't have much? I think the rules are pretty much the same. Do what you can. Don't be afraid to give sacrificially. In sacrificial giving, it's not the amount that matters, but the cost to the giver. Never the size, but the sacrifice. The only person in the New Testament that Jesus mentions as a pattern of generosity was a person who gave a gift of two mites, the widow's two mites, and that was just about the amount of one of our pennies. In his commentary on Mark's gospel, William Barclay comments, we may feel we don't have much in material or personal gifts to give to Christ, but if we put all we have at his disposal, he can do things with it and with us that are beyond our imagination. We have been saved by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have been sanctified or set apart for the Master's service. Now we must learn to trust God as our Savior, our seer, healer, our sanctifier, and our source. Uh, it's been over 40 years ago that I, I wrote the following for one of our, our uh, adult Sunday school student lessons. Christ is the answer to the crises of life. He is the answer to man's deep need. With him as Lord of our lives, we can cope with the unexpected with peace and confidence. We can face the future with our heads held high if we have bowed low in the presence of God. Obstacles can become stepping stones to higher experiences with the Lord. So if we remember that God already knows what we have need of, and we will live our lives like he wants to live them. I believe we can trust him to supply all of our need. And let me leave you with uh, one of my favorite portions of Psalm 37. Listen to these closely because these words are, are to us today. Trust in the Lord. Or first of all, it says, don't worry. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Don't look around and get all upset about everything that's going on. But trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgments as the noonday. And then finally, rest. Once you're committed to him, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him to answer your prayer. I think those are good rules to follow. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We don't know... We read it and it says you know everything we need. And yet sometimes we almost wonder, Lord, do you really, do you really know everything I need? But I think we found as we trust you, even though everything might happen just like we'd like it to happen, you do in the end do that which is right. You supply our needs or you help us get through the situation. You don't always deliver us from it, but sometimes you do see us through it. And we thank you for that. So I pray today that if there are those with financial needs, that you will help them to trust you. Lord, you, you have emphasized in your word today that you know what we have need of. So I pray that you'll help any that are in need to trust you God knows what you need. God knows how to supply it. To trust him with all your heart. And Lord, we would not want to close without 
giving an invitation to those that, that may not know you. We can go through a lot of struggles, but if we don't know you, there, there it's so much harder to go through those things than it is when we know you. So I pray that if there are any that are not saved, that today they will look to you. They'll give their hearts to you. They'll begin to follow you and give their hearts and lives to you and let you supply all of their needs. For these things we pray and we earnestly ask that you would meet all these needs for we pray in Jesus' name and all for your glory. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for The Chapel Hour with Rev. Russell Weishart and the Weishart Family Singers. For previous programs, please go to YouTube and search for The Weishart Family Singers Channel. If you're a minister, teacher, or student of the Bible and would like to access Rev. Weishart's messages, outlines, and sermon notes, please go to thechapelhour.blogspot.com. And of course, one of the best ways to stay in touch with us is on the Weishart Family Singers Facebook page. We want to thank everyone for finding us, for your encouragement, for subscribing to our channel, and for hitting that little like button. We look forward to seeing you next week on The Chapel Hour.